Philip Miller is the last man standing on Earth after a mysterious, unidentified virus wipes out all human life. After a year of living alone, he is currently traveling the United States in search of people. He visits every state, making announcements in deserted cities and pilfering paintings and artifacts from establishments that house museums. Following the unsuccessful search for humans, Philip makes the decision to go back to Tucson, his hometown. Nevertheless, in his final search for a partner, he writes alive in Tucson on every billboard he comes across. He heads to his rundown apartment in Tucson and gathers everything he needs before heading to a gated community in the more affluent area of the city. He announces that the largest house will be his new residence. Over the course of the following few days, he decorates the house with all of the well-known paintings, as well as numerous items worth billions of dollars, including an Academy Awards, a dinosaur skull, and a White House mat. It would make Nicolas Cage proud. Philip always apologizes to God before turning in for the night for his excessive masturbation and expresses his wish to see the face of a woman before he passes away. Fortunately, he can still drive around in a wide variety of vehicles. Wearing only his panties, he robs the grocery store with a gun. Now that he has no one to impress, he has entirely forgotten basic decency in just a year. In addition, he takes actions that were only spontaneous thoughts prior to the infection, such as smashing the store's can pile and bringing hundreds of pornographic movies home to kill time. He smashes cars into other cars and bowls with lamps and aquariums. He gets a shot of adrenaline from the chaos, which helps him deal with his loneliness. A month or so later, he begins to lose his sense of rationality. In addition, spending his birthday alone makes him realize all the things he took for granted back when things were normal. He misses life, his mother, and people in general. The action shifts to a few months later. The opulent mansion that Philip called home is now a landfill. Because there is no purpose for it, he never cleans it up, so it is full of plastic and cans. He has taken to living like an animal and hasn't taken a shower in days. There isn't any running water in the house, and plastic bottles are all over the toilet. Philip instead hollows out the springboard and uses the swimming pool as a makeshift lavatory. He also pours margaritas into a kid's pool and takes a bath in it while sipping from it. I hope he never confuses the two pools. Then one day, he goes to the bar and gives the balls names and personalities by drawing faces on them. To make himself feel less alone, he converses with them as though they were his true friends. He visits a clothes store at night with a ball he calls Gary, and he makes eye contact with a mannequin he's crushing on. Philip goes crazy when her arm breaks. He makes the terrible decision to commit suicide on the nearby hill after deciding he no longer wants to live. With a promise to always remember them, he bids his ball pals farewell. Then he climbs into his car and speeds up toward the hill. He stops the vehicle just in time to prevent an accident after noticing smoke rising in the distance. Philip's eyes nearly defy belief. He quickly follows the smoke to a trailer that is obviously occupied by someone. Subsequently, he discovers what he had been pleading to see for the previous 12 months. An individual has exposed their bra to the sun to dry. When Philip smells it, he becomes so overcome with emotion that he passes out. He awakens to find himself in the lap of a stunning girl. She gives him a kiss and seductively promises to grant his wishes. Before Philip wakes up and realizes he was dreaming, he is enjoying the kiss. The girl in front of him is older and less pretty. To save his life, she is giving him CPR. They separate from one another, uncomfortable seeing another person after such a long time. She replies that Philip should be more concerned about his drenched underwear than the attractive woman, at which point he asks her where she is. It turns out that during his unconscious state, he urinated on himself. Philip says he was swimming from the front side earlier, which is why his underpants are wet, even in a situation like this. The girl panics as he begins angrily to explain that he did not urinate on himself. She motions for him to move away as she pulls out a gun. At last, Philip acknowledges that he urinates and expresses his embarrassment. They introduce themselves once they have both calmed down. Carol is the name of the girl. Before the virus, she worked as an analyst, and since everyone died, she has been roving around America. She came here to check if she truly was the last person alive after seeing the Alive in Tucson sign. Philip isn't overly thrilled to see Carol, even though he had been dying to meet a woman. She constantly fixes his grammar and talks endlessly about unrelated topics. They decide to drive to the grocery store after a lengthy conversation. Carol gripes about him running the stop sign while they are traveling. She is adamant that they must abide by the rules or else they will begin to live like animals, even though Philip argues that there is no traffic. In an attempt to cheer her up, he pulls over at a sign and checks to make sure nobody is crossing the street. 
When they get to the grocery store and Philip parks in the handicapped space, she doesn't stop bugging him. In their fifth disagreement of the day, Philip argues that there is plenty of room for this fictitious disabled person to park his car. He drives the car right into the store when Carol continues to nag him to park somewhere else. He lives in a way that disgusts her, so she proceeds to tour his home after that. He has two swimming pools, one with trash in it and one with excrement in it. Even though he maintains that the paintings no longer belong to anyone, Carol accuses him of stealing them. Philip asks her to return to her campsite at the conclusion of the house tour. Carol wakes him up the following morning to finish tidying his home. They have to start acting like humans, so she badgers him to go buy cleaning and gardening supplies. Philip complains about Carol to his ball buddies at night. Despite their short acquaintance, he already feels as though they are a married couple in dire need of a divorce. Things worsen for him the next morning when she moves into the house next door. Carol is obstinate, being Carol, even though he tries to shoo her away. Philip removes his pants in response to her question about whether he is afraid of being seen in his underwear. Finally addressing the big issue, Carol brings up the subject of reproduction. She believes that they are the chosen ones, entrusted with the responsibility of replenishing the planet's population. In this instance, Philip's statement that he wouldn't sleep with her even if she were the last woman on the planet is accurate. He is using his outdoor restroom when Carol finds him in the following scene. She wants him to figure out how to supply their home with running water. They can then grow tomatoes and other fruits in this manner. She tries to bribe him with fresh tomatoes when he doesn't want to help, but he doesn't seem to mind. She ought to be aware that trying to buy a guy off a diving board is a bad idea. But as night falls, he burrows into her garden and devours every vegetable she grows. The following morning, Carol knocks on his door and discovers him covered in leftover tomatoes. Philip continues to insist that he did not steal them. He also observes that Carol, while attempting to carry water from a manhole to her house, has injured her leg. She gives up on trying to live a decent human life a few days later. Philip discovers her imitating his swimming pool toilet by building an outdoor toilet in a fountain. Carol believes that rather than being the chosen, they might be the forgotten people who are without meaning in life. When they can't even put together a toilet in their million-dollar homes, they are in no position to create an entire human civilization. Philip, who typically views Carol as upbeat, feels terrible for her. He thus makes plans to water Carol's garden by going to the city's water tank. She extends an invitation to supper since she is at last relieved to see a nice side of him. Philip enjoys his first organic meal of the evening. When the subject of sex comes up, Philip states he's ready to go to sleep with her right now. To his surprise, though, Carol refuses to have sex before getting married. Philip chuckles at first, assuming it's a joke, but she turns out to be serious. He suggests that they do this to cheer her up, even though the idea is absurd. They ultimately decide to tie the knot the following day. They are saying their vows in a church in the scene that follows. Even though Philip doesn't think it's necessary, he still follows the act. A large group of guests greets them as soon as they exit the church. Philip screams as he realizes his mistake. Then, relieved that it was only a dream, he wakes up on his bed. To make sure most of the world is still dead, he even has to look out the window. Carol brings food to his house a while later. In her opinion, voters ought to choose the President of the United States. Philip unanimously elects himself President, which is pointless. After that, Carol suggests that the two eat spaghetti and raisin balls as a healthy substitute for meatballs. The day of the wedding eventually arrives after that. Philip's job is to get rings for them while Carol prepares the cake and decorations. But instead of receiving the rings, he throws his ball buddies a bachelorette party and sets fire to various items in a parking lot. He even tells the mannequin that she will always be the love of his life as he leaves. After work, he heads to the church where Carol has made a recording that will serve as their wedding officiant. It's finally time to exchange rings after a few brief vows. Carol finds out that he didn't get them at this point. She cancels the wedding after realizing she is the only one making an effort. Philip tries to talk to her later by knocking on her door, but she doesn't answer. As a result, he uses a hammer to smash through the front door and gets inside. She's actually made an attempt to decorate it, much to his surprise. She even made a cake for them, topped with a statue of him. Philip apologizes to her and says he feels terrible about what he did. He also says that although he doesn't particularly enjoy her cooking or her demeanor, he is still happy that she is in the world because he would not be here today if she hadn't existed. Having said that, Philip calls her outside to perform a unique task. They visit a jewelry store in the scene that follows where Carol finds every ring she could possibly want. 
At last, they perform the wedding ceremony and are pronounced husband and wife. When the two make love at night, Philip is not prepared for what he gets into. Carol talks nonstop all night long, saying odd things that she finds attractive. She discovers him playing racquetball in his house the following morning. To his surprise, she joins him in the game when Philip expects her to nag him once more. They spend the remainder of the day doing the things Philip usually does, like building fireproof suits and setting each other on fire, running a bulldozer over beer cans, and going to see the mannequin that used to be Philip's ex-girlfriend. After a lengthy conversation, Carol scolds her for making advances toward her husband. For the first time, Philip feels happy about his marriage to her and believes that their future together could be bearable. They run into a limo at a crosswalk on their way back home. Startled, Philip rushes to the vehicle and witnesses a stunning woman get out. He began to regret their marriage just as he was beginning to feel content with his wife. Watch the second part to find out what happens to them next. View it on our channel, Movie Flicks Recaps, or click the link in the description.